I say wow because I look out and we have a very good assembly or a good good attendance here this morning. I looked out last week, and of course I saw the holes that I was expecting to see with so many traveling. And I look out this morning. I'm so happy to see those holes are few, uh, filled back up. We also have several visitors that are here with us. Of course, we have our regular members that are here with us, and I'm uh, thankful for you as well. It's an encouragement to just see so many people and be together with so many people that are interested in, in spiritual things and, and making God a priority in our, our, our lives. I want to talk about something a little bit different this morning. We've been going through the book of Matthew. We took a break from that last week, and this past week I was planning about talk, planning to go back to Matthew chapter 7, but I had some thoughts that came to me and I wanted to to tell you a little bit about some things that I was thinking about this past week. So in Revelation chapter 3, we went studied several months back, we were talking about the seven churches of Asia. We went through each one specifically. And in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus was addressing the church at Philadelphia, among others, but I want to talk briefly about the church at Philadelphia. You remember that when we studied the seven churches of Asia, we noted that Philadelphia specifically, the city itself, it was set up to be this missionary city for the Greek culture. In other words, it was meant to be the gateway for Greek culture to go out to the east. And the reason that it was set up as a missionary city was it was put at that location because it was set on this particular highway that ran from Europe out to the east. And you remember that when Jesus was talking to the church at Philadelphia, one of the things that he told them was he says in Revelation 3 and verse 8, he says, Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. An open door. That's what our lesson is titled here this morning. What does that mean? An open door. Of course, we understand that an open door is symbolic of an opportunity. The church at Philadelphia, they had an opportunity according to what we read here in Revelation chapter 3. And what was that opportunity? Well, it was an opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, their location in particular, it gave them an especially strong opportunity to spread the gospel. They had an opportunity. They better not waste it. I'm going to pull the curtain back just a little bit this morning. Recently, I was having a conversation with our elders about the work specifically here at Ardmore. And we were talking about the long-term outlook for the church here at Ardmore. But I ask you the question this morning, what is the outlook of this church? And I ask you that question because it's a question, it's important that we think about these things. What is our outlook for this congregation? And I want to share with you a few things that we reflected on as we talked about that. I think the point needs to be made, brethren, is that we here at the Ardmore Church of Christ, we have an open door that is set before us, just like was the case with the church at Philadelphia. And I say that for several reasons. For example, one reason that I say that is we know that over the next few years, and it's even starting now, we are going to have all kinds of opportunity just from the fact that our population in this area, it is growing significantly. Karen and I have seen this you know, firsthand in Athens, but it's going to be working its way up through Elkmont, through Tony, through Ardmore. This area is growing in population. A lot of that's due to the fact that we have many jobs that are coming to this area, which is great. That's good for our local economy. Uh, people are moving from outside to come into this area to get these jobs. And I want you to understand that it's going to be a mixture of people coming in. Some people are going to be moving to this area. They may be Christians from another place coming to get a job here. And they're going to be looking for a church home. I would like for us to be able to provide that home for them. But I also want you to understand another part of that opportunity is the fact that with these jobs and the population growth, a lot of the people coming in are not going to be Christians. And what that does is it's going to present a lot of new opportunities, people that we've never met. It's going to present an opportunity for us to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have an opportunity as a congregation, specifically in this area, to share the gospel. You know, it's no secret that there are a lot of congregations just within Limestone County, just within you know, North Alabama, this region of the country. And I want you to understand, you know, for sake of the kingdom of God, it is my main prayer that people will find themselves in a faithful group of God's people, regardless of whether it's here at Ardmore or whether it's 
somewhere else. I just want people to be faithful to the Lord. However, I want to talk specifically here to the congregation this morning and understand I believe that this congregation right here is primed for growth. I believe that with all my heart. Several reasons for that. One big reason is the fact that we here at Ardmore, we have biblically appointed elders. And you know, I said that we have a lot of congregations out in this, this area. A lot of those congregations don't have that. A lot of those congregations, they don't have elders and sadly are really not even trying to have elders. How blessed we are that we have two very qualified men to be elders. We also have members of all ages. You know, a lot of congregations, uh, the, the demographics uh, vary quite a bit from church to church. We are blessed to have several you know, older, wiser members that can help guide the younger. But we also have some young families. We have young children. We're blessed with a wide variety of ages and people that attend here. And that, that, you know, those two things alone make for a very attractive congregation for someone coming, you know, moving to this area. However, let me tell you also, this is really what I want to get to this morning. Let me tell you that when we were talking about the long-term outlook for this congregation, you know, I told you we have a lot of people coming into this area you know, and I say that this would be a good place for someone to call home. But I want to tell you this morning, the big question or the answer to the big question as to whether or not this church grows depends on you. I want you to think about that. And what I mean by that is that we are a lot like Philadelphia. We have this open door of opportunity in this area. So the question is, is what are you? What are we as a congregation? What are we going to do with it? What a shame it would be for us to have such a good opportunity and for us to choose to waste it. First point I want to talk about this morning is the fact that we as Christians, we need to understand the responsibility that we have in regards to the Gospel. Not only are we to obey the Gospel, we're also called to share the Gospel with others. You know, we t use that term gospel. Of course, what we're talking about when I use that term gospel is we're talking about the good news. We're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news that even though we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because of Christ and His sacrifice, we can be reconciled to God. We can have a relationship with Him because of His Son. And that is good news. That it needs to be shared with the world. It needs to be shared with those that we come in contact with in our everyday lives. For example, one point on this, of course, a very familiar passage, actually a couple of very familiar passages here in Mark and Matthew. This is at the end of Christ's earthly life. After His death and after His resurrection, but before His ascension, we refer to this text as the Great Commission. Because He told the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 19, He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, go make disciples. They were to teach others what they had learned. You know, the teachings of Christ was not something that was just only to be practiced by this initial group of disciples that knew the Lord during His life. They were to take these things that they had learned to the nations. A parallel passage to this is in Mark chapter 16 where he says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Again, he says, Go! Proclaim the gospel. In other words, go and tell people. Why? Because if they believed in the message and if they responded in it, They'd be saved. It's an important message. And you know, many will look at passages such as this and they'll say, well, that doesn't apply to me. He was talking to those disciples. He was talking to the apostles. This was their mission. And I would tell you, yeah, he was primarily at first talking to them. But I think you can also look forward and see what follows these commandments in the book of Acts. And it shows just how that commission was carried out. 
We know that in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to get to Acts 8 in just a second, but in Acts chapter 2, this was the day of Pentecost. We know this is the establishment of the church where the, the Jews, they heard the gospel message, they responded to that message, they were saved, and they were added to the church according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. But it doesn't end with Acts chapter 2. Eventually you get down to Acts chapter 8, which I've got on the overhead this morning. In the context of this passage is where the church, they're being persecuted. And they were persecuted to the extent that even though the church was all together there in Jerusalem, they were persecuted to the extent that the church, it says that they scattered. They scattered throughout the regions. And notice what they did when they scattered. Verse 4, Now those who were scattered, what did they do? They went about preaching the Word. It wasn't just the apostles preaching the Gospel. Those that had been saved by the Gospel, they were leaving and they were taking the message with them to those that they met along the way as they, they scattered. Thus, the message continued to spread and it continued to spread even more. But not just by the apostles, not just by the, the quote, dedicated preachers, by all Christians, the message went forth. I believe the early church sets for us an example that the church was actively involved in evangelism. I think we also need to understand that we as Christians, we are also commanded to confess Christ before others. A couple passages that come to mind, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, it says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Another verse to go with this, 1 John 4 and verse 15, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. You know, often when we think about this idea of confession and you know our command to confess our faith in Christ before others, often what we tend to do is we limit it to what we see, for example, in the account in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 where you have the Ethiopian eunuch where the story of his conversion, we see that he confessed before his baptism, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's absolutely something that we are all called to do. You cannot be a Christian without confessing Him as Lord. But let me submit to you the fact that confession is not just a one-time act that we sometimes make it out to be. In fact, I would submit to you that the confession that one makes before they are baptized is likely the easiest confession that they will ever make in their lives. And why do I say that? Because usually that confession is before brethren that are very excited to hear that confession made. But confession is not something that we're only called to do among brethren. What happens when we confess to our brethren that we believe in Christ, but yet we go out into the world and we never confess Christ to the world? While confession is certainly something that is very a very important part of the conversion process, we see it is necessary to be saved. It's not something that's a one-time act. Confession is something that Christians are called to do throughout their lives. We need to remember that. Another thing that I want to connect with this, we, we prayed about this just this morning, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, Peter here makes a point that I think goes very well with our, our previous two points where he says that we, always, we should be always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We understand that Christians are going to be very different from the world. We're called to be. And we're even told in passages such as 1 Peter chapter 3 that often because of our faith, because we are different, we're going to suffer because of our faith. And why are Christians willing to suffer? because of their faith. Well, because as this passage alludes to, we have hope. We have hope of salvation. We have hope of a home in heaven with God. This world is not our home. And sometimes people may ask us, why do you live like you do? Why do you not live like we do? Why don't you just go with the crowd and make life easier on yourself? We need to be able to defend, as Peter talks about here in 1 Peter 3, why we are willing to be different, why we're willing to endure persecution, why we make sacrifices, 
And our defense is the gospel. We need to be sharing that with others. We need to be ready to share that with others. We as Christians have a responsibility to share the gospel. You may say this morning, well, I can't travel the world. I can't go to, to foreign countries and teach the gospel. For some, you know, some can, and, and for some that may not be reasonable. And I would tell you, that's reasonable. But I would ask you this morning, what about that lady at the supermarket that you see every week when you get your groceries? What about that neighbor that you see you know, across the driveway every day? What about your coworker? What about your teammate? What about your classmate? What about those people that you interact with throughout your life? We at this church, we have a responsibility to share the gospel. Yes, we support men in other places that go to, to harder regions to preach the gospel, and I appreciate them, and I appreciate this church for supporting him in that. But I want you to understand, Ardmore, Alabama, Tony, Alabama, Harvest, Athens, Elkmont, that's all part of the world as well. We as Christians here in this area, we ought to be taking the gospel to this community. It is part of our mission as Christians. We need to be thinking about that. Our last point this morning, our, our last main point this morning, understanding that evangelism is part of our responsibilities as Christians. I want us to talk quickly this morning about some potential reasons why we might still avoid evangelism, even though we know it's our responsibility. I think there are some reasons why we put it off or why we avoid it in our life. For example, I put this at the very top of the list because I think it's probably at the top of most of your lists as well. And that's the fact that talking to someone about the gospel, it's often uncomfortable. And I would say that, understanding that because if you know me at all, you know that I'm the type of person that just the idea of talking to someone that I've never met, uh, someone that I don't know very well, that makes me uncomfortable. You know, I don't consider myself to be very outgoing. I'm very much introverted. Uh, and, and maybe you all don't think that, but I am. But then you add on top of that the idea of about talking about something sensitive like religion. You know, being uncomfortable when it comes to evangelism. I relate to that. It's relatable. I get it. But it's also something that we need to overcome. I think about in Acts chapter 4, a uh, passage where the brethren, they were praying for boldness. And while, of course, this could apply, you know, praying for boldness, it could apply to situations where, like them, they were going through this persecution and they prayed for boldness. But could we not pray a very similar prayer this morning that if we're uncomfortable sharing the gospel, we could pray that God will help us overcome that? Pray for boldness that even though it might be a little uncomfortable, we'll still do it anyway. And then you also think about the idea about being uncomfortable for the gospel. You need to think about the fact, and I can't help but think about the fact, how uncomfortable was the cross for our Savior. But yet He did that for you and He did that for me. The least I can do is go tell people about it, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. We need to remember that. Another reason why we avoid evangelism is also the, the fear of rejection. <clears throat> Moses, you remember the story in, in Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4 where God speaks to, to Moses from the, the burning bush. And God was calling Moses to go and to lead the people out of Egyptian bondage. And you remember at one point in that discussion, one of the things that Moses you know, makes an excuse for in regards to this commission was he told God in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. He was afraid of rejection. But I would submit to you this morning, the fear of rejection, that is Satan's work. That is Satan's way of tempting you not to share the gospel. Understand, Satan doesn't want any of us to be saved. He doesn't want anyone in the world to come to Christ. In fact, his goal is the exact opposite. And brethren, the fact is, is that I understand not everyone is going to accept the gospel. Many are going to reject the gospel. Many have. But that doesn't need to keep us from trying. I think also about the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. We haven't gotten there in our study yet, we'll certainly come back to that, Lord willing, and talk about it in more detail. But you remember that story 
the sower, where was he spreading the seed? Not just on the good ground. He was spreading it wherever. Some of it fell on ground that wasn't so good. The good ground, it says, received the seed and it grew. And that's what happens when we share the gospel with a, a very humble and receptive and willing heart. But understand, it's not for us to decide whether someone is the good ground or whether it's the rocky or the bad ground. It's not up for us to decide whether or not that person is going to receive the word or whether they're going to reject it. We spread the seed regardless. You know, even after many reject the gospel, maybe you talk to several people and they all reject you. Don't give up. Because that next person may be a lost soul that hears you and is saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let the fear of rejection keep you from sharing the message of the gospel. Another reason why we sometimes avoid evangelism is we avoid it because we're afraid we don't know enough. We lack the knowledge uh, that we think we need to have to teach. And I understand that you know, to teach someone, you do have to have some manner of knowledge. I'm not denying that at all. And I get that. You know, sometimes I doubt myself. I actually do it all the time. You know, when we're trying to convince someone of the truth of the gospel, I'll tell you firsthand, sometimes you know, it's not uncommon for them to ask you a question and you don't know the answer to it. You need to go study about it. You need to ask for someone else's help in that. Someone that's a little bit more studied. Uh, Moses was actually, this is one of the excuses he also makes in Exodus chapter 3. He was afraid of something very similar. He was afraid that he wouldn't know what to do when the people asked him questions. For example, one of the questions was, he says, what, you know, what did they ask me? Who, you know, who sent me? How shall I answer them? You remember God's remedy for Moses? He gave him the words to say. He told him what to say. And we're not very much different from this. In a similar way, he has given us the things to say. Where is it? It's in His Word. Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is profitable for teaching. It is able to thoroughly equip us, it says in 2 Timothy 3. God has given us the words to say. It's just up to us to study it so that we know what He wants us to tell people. But let me also share with you this morning, I know that study can take some time. One of the reasons we are so blessed here at this congregation is we have some very knowledgeable men that can help you. If you're just getting started and if you're just learning these things, there are some knowledgeable people in this congregation that will help you and want to help you. Brother Eubanks, I'm so envious but also appreciative of his years of study. I wish I knew all the things that he does and maybe at one point I'll get to that point. Uh, you know, our elders, I am thankful for their wisdom and for their years of study in the Scriptures. And it's not just Brother Eubanks, it's not just our elders. We have so many in this congregation that have had years of study that know the Scriptures. I would tell you this morning, use those resources. They want to help you. You know, Part of my responsibility is not just to teach you things for your benefit. Yes, I hope you benefit from it. But I'm also hopeful that you'll take the lessons that we talk about here on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights, I'm hoping you'll take these lessons and I hope you go share them with the community as well. That's part of my responsibility as a preacher. You know, if a lack of knowledge is what's holding you back, I would tell you this morning, let's work on preparing ourselves. And we can do that by studying the Scriptures and we ask for help when we need it. Don't be afraid to do that. One more that I want to talk about this morning. Now, there's no good reason for avoiding evangelism. I want you to understand that. But I left this one for the end because I think this might be one of the most prevalent reasons that people avoid sharing the gospel. And I want to tell you this morning, it is a pure misconception if this is your excuse for not sharing the gospel. I think that this mindset in particular is an obstacle not just for the gospel, but when we're talking about accomplishing any task, accomplishing any work, this mindset is an obstacle when it comes to accomplishing our goals. But unfortunately, as we're talking about evangelism this morning, this is something that impacts evangelism as well. Sometimes when there's work to be done, often it ends up undone because people just don't see it as their responsibility. We want someone else to do it. You know, we think someone else would do a better job. Moses is very similar to this. I keep talking about Exodus 3 and 4. 
Actually, I have a separate lesson just on those passages. I don't need to dig in too much because I may give that lesson at some point. But you remember at one point in that discussion with God when God was telling him to go and bring the people out of Egypt, finally he just said to God, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. He wanted someone else to go. I would ask you this morning as you examine yourself, is this your attitude towards evangelism? You know, I think one of the fatal mistakes that churches sometimes make, and often I say, and I say fatal because this mindset can kill a church, is the view that evangelism, it is the work of the preacher, it's the work of the elders, and it's not everyone's work. Are the elders responsible for evangelism? Yeah, absolutely. Are the preachers, are we responsible for teaching the gospel to others? Absolutely. It is my responsibility. But evangelism is not just limited to those roles. It's your responsibility to reach out to the lost whether you ever stand in a pulpit or not. And we've already talked about how Christians, we have a responsibility to evangelism or to evangelize. I would ask you this morning, do we take that seriously or do we not? Do we see that person that needs the gospel but we say, well, I'm not the preacher. I'll tell you something. People are all very different. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Sometimes people don't want to talk to the preacher. Sometimes they don't want to talk to the elders because that's a little bit intimidating. Sometimes they would rather talk to those members that they have a connection with. Someone that they have things in common with. Sometimes that personal connection, actually very often that personal connection is what helps open someone up to be receptive to the gospel. What if I told you this morning that there is someone in your life that needed the gospel and you specifically were the one that was most likely to get them to come to the Lord? Brethren, a lot of whether or not we are taking advantage of that open door that we're talking about is whether or not we as a congregation, not just me, not just the elders, not just Brother Eubanks, whether we are all seeking to lead the lost to Christ. I will do whatever I can to help in this regard. But it's going to take each and every one of us to accept this responsibility and take the, law, the gospel to the lost in our community. This is a congregation or a conversation that I think that we need to continue. And Lord willing, perhaps we'll continue this discussion at a later time. This is some things I was thinking about this week and I wanted to share that with you this morning. Brethren, it's my hope and prayer that this congregation will continue to grow. However, it is even more so my hope and my prayer that lost souls will come to Christ. That's the goal. This congregation, as we talked about this morning, we have an open door to go out into this community and lead people to Christ. And in the future, perhaps we'll talk about ways that we can get motivated to do this, but also we'll talk about some suggestions on how we can go about you know, starting those conversations with people that we know in our lives. As we conclude here this morning, I want to talk now to those that might be here and are not yet part of the body of Christ. If you're here this morning and that's your position, I want you to know this morning that God loves you. He loves you so much that despite that you sinned, you separated yourself from Him, that He sent His Son to be a sacrifice for your sins. And you can have a relationship with God, but you have to be willing to submit your life to His will. You must put your trust in Him. You must turn from sin. You must confess Him before others as we talked about this morning. And you must be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. Jesus taught whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And what a wonderful promise that we have there from our Lord. And He is faithful to that promise. So as you consider these things this morning, if you'd like to turn your life over to Christ, we would love to help you with that in any way that we possibly can. So this morning, if you are subject to the Lord's invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.